I have a part. It's an airplane part. This part is readily available, so I can buy it, but it's 300 bucks. What if this part wasn't available or it was 3000 bucks? Could we make this part? Let's explore that in today's video. Look me in the eye and tell me that a part that was probably designed in the 50s cannot be improved upon in 2025 moving into 2026. I'll call you a liar. Okay, welcome back. I just filmed a video and posted it maybe five minutes ago and I'm back outside in the open air studio um, to deliver more value. Um, so I am concerned, as you are, about parts and parts availability and just the cost of things to keep these 50, 60, sometimes 70 or 80 year old airplanes flying. Um, it has become obvious that some of us don't realize that technology has moved on. We've improved the way that we do things. We have brought costs down for pretty much every other industry and every other hobby, probably because of scale, right? Talk about cars and boats. You got a billion cars and a million boats and only like 2,000, 20,000 airplanes. Um, more like 200,000 airplanes, but whatever the number is, we're not able to perform at the same scale as everybody else. The number is inconsequential. What we have to do is use modern tools and modern techniques to get the things that we need to keep these airplanes flying. So I promised you a story. This house behind me is not mine. That might become a surprise or come as a surprise to some of you, but I rent this house. I don't own this house. Is it a sacrifice I'm making to fly small airplanes? No, uh, the rent is still more or just about what I'd be paying for a mortgage, but um, I choose to rent. I like the flexibility and I'm actually supporting somebody else who happens to be an aviator. The owner of this house is an aviator. I met him because he asked me to make a panel for his airplane. I ran into someone online just in a forum on Facebook, it was the Bonanza group, one of the Bonanza groups, and he was just looking for this, a governor bracket for an airplane that he's repairing. He's bought an airplane, it had a, a long stint of inactivity, and he's trying to get that airplane up and flying again. So he said, hey, this is a governor bracket, it's the thing that controls the prop in the uh, variable pitch prop. Um, this is connected to the, the, the blue lever. It um, you know, connects to the governor at the, the front and it moves the governor um, to different angles to control that uh, pitch of the prop. And he just said, does anyone have one of these for sale? And on that forum, he got met with, oh, don't be a cheapskate, just buy the thing. Um, and my comment to him was, I know it's expensive, I wonder what it would cost to make our own. I could probably get it done way cheaper. And the first response after that was, oh, I couldn't even set up my machine to make this for as much as he's gonna buy it for, $300. Just suck it up and go buy the thing. Um, I didn't agree with that. I said, hey, it just looks like a simple part. I don't, I don't really see the big deal. And I still don't see the big deal. So let's talk about this a little bit. Oh, the whole house thing. It turns out that person that I met in the forums that was looking for this thing is working with the owner of this house to repair the airplane that he's asking you know, about for this, this little bracket. So there's the connection. But let's talk about it just a little bit and see where we can go with a project like this. So the list price on this thing was about $325, less than an AMU, less than an aviation monetary unit, which is $1,000. Anything that's less than an AMU is typically a good deal in aviation. And most people would just say, hey, go buy it. It's a really cheap part, 300 bucks. But the way that things are in the world right now, there are certain people who are actually struggling to afford to keep up their airplane. It might look on the outside that they're successful, 
when they've got this nice aircraft and they fly all over the place. But those bills rack up. And $100, $50, $25 sometimes is the difference between an airplane that doesn't fly and an airplane that does. So I took it upon myself. I reached out to this guy and I'm like, hey, I'm Jawanza. I've got this channel. He goes, yeah, I follow your channel. It's step number one. That's awesome. But then after that, he said, I will gladly mail you the one that I bought, which is this one. This is actually his. He mailed this thing to me and doesn't even know who I am. Um, I'll mail you this thing so you can do an academic exercise to figure out how much it would cost to make exactly this thing. Now, here's a disclaimer. I am not going to make one of these things to put on an airplane. I'm not even going to think about putting it on an airplane. There's a longer process that would have to be followed for legality's sake on how to get this legally onto a certified airplane. Can we go through that process? Yes, the FAA gives us methods of doing that. There's a single-use STC process, there's a field approval, you can work with your AMP to decide whether a modification is a major or a minor. There are advisory circulars out there that give you guidance on what is and what is not legal to do to your airplane, whether it's making your own parts or not. So could we get there? Yes. Will we get there? No. I am going to stop at the academic proof that these things can be reproduced if necessary. The fact that this is available off the shelf makes it the better option to go with. You can go buy one of these tomorrow, go buy it tomorrow. But if this was not available, if the manufacturer is out of these or there's no more supply, what would we do? So I got this thing in hand, in house, I hit it with a 3D scanner my Creality Raptor that I bought several years ago. It's paid dividends by now. And it's accurate enough to have picked up each and every single one of the bends and the holes and all the detail. I took that 3D scan. I didn't put it into CAD. I just took the raw 3D scan and I made this. This is a 3D printed version of that bracket. It is exactly one for one, the exact same part in plastic and in some sort of metal. What I did this for was to prove to you and people online that there are modern techniques that can get us here. Now you would never put this on an engine. This thing is very flexible. It will break if I try to bend it. It's only PLA. If I heat it up, it will actually deform but it was proof that a modern technique could produce a part. Now, there are services that will take the same file, this exact file, and print this in a metal, a metal material, either aluminum or stainless steel. You can get that done very easily. And I actually got a quote to do exactly that for this exact part, and that quote was $25. $25 to make a stainless steel version of this plastic part. That company is called PCB Way. They make PCBs, they make control boards for electronics and stuff, but they also do 3D printing in practically any material that is 3D printable. Nylon, ABS, PLA, PETG, PETG, carbon fiber, um, anything you can think of. And they do metal printing. So I got that quote and it was about $25 to make one of these things. If I wanted to make 20 of these things, it'd be like $4 a piece. So $300 off the shelf versus let's say a group of us went in and bought several of these things, four, five, six dollars a piece, plus shipping and imports and tariffs and all kinds of stuff. But still less than $20 for each one of us to have a thing. It could be a bracket. It could be whatever else. Again, I'm not ordering this not actually doing this. I'm just showing that a modern manufacturing technique can help us to get parts in general aviation. So we're looking at this and we're going, okay, well, it's just a piece of sheet metal. 
and it's just got bends in it. It's just 90 degree bends or something a little bit more than 90 degrees perhaps. You know, could a local or a US based custom, uh, company do something like this? Yeah. A perfect example was the company that I've been talking to lately called Send Cut Send. I left a URL in the description for you to go in and click. It's got open source GA at the end of the URL. It's because when you click on that link, it just tells Send Cut Send. It's a little counter that they're watching. It tells Send Cut Send that some pilot or some owner or some AMP or some maker is interested in learning more about Send Cut Send in an aviation context since this is an aviation channel. I don't get a kickback. I don't get a sponsorship. I don't get money every time you click on the link. It's not an affiliate link. It's legitimately just a counter that they've put that says, show me the proof that these people out here in your community are interested in making parts. I took that 3D scan, I put it into SolidWorks, my free version of SolidWorks that I got as an EAA member. I drew it out, I converted it into a sheet metal part, and this all sounds really fancy, and it kind of is for most people, but for me who went through college to become an aerospace engineer, that was a 15 minute experience or process from the time I got this into my house to the time I actually uploaded it to Sand Cut Send. And Sand Cut Send would charge $7 to make a flat version of this without the bends, just the flat shape, $7. And I tried it in stainless steel, I tried it in thin titanium, I tried it in aluminum, I tried it in all kinds of different materials that they have available on Send Cut Send, and about seven to ten dollars is exactly what all of them came out to be in eighth inch material. I took the appropriate thickness measurement with some calipers, and it's eighth inch. So that leaves us with the bending part. The flat part would be cut, and then the bends would have to get put in. From about seven to ten dollars for the flat part, it ups it to maybe twenty dollars, twenty-five dollars to make the bent up part. So the 3D print method on PCBWay versus the bent up method on Send Cut Send turned out to be practically exactly the same cost. And Send Cut Send will bring the price down if we order if we ordered more of these. The experimental world is full of stories like these. Rudder pedals and pulleys and brackets and all the other things that can go on experimental airplanes. The type clubs get together in a forum post and says, hey, who wants one of these things? And the person that makes the post, the engineer or the designer who's in there, gets 50 of them made. And all of a sudden, this experimental old airplane or brand new airplane keeps flying really affordably, really safe too. The thing I'm not addressing here, and the thing you're probably wondering about is, how do I know what material to use? I did a course in university years ago um, called Strength of Materials, and it's exactly what it sounds like. It's talking about the strength of materials. It's a part of your statics and dynamics courses where you learn how to load something up and analytically tell that it's strong enough to hold the load that you're trying to put on it. I put a magnet on this thing and a magnet was sucked onto it, so immediately I ruled out the idea that it was aluminum and figured it was probably steel. Because aviation parts typically don't use titanium in general aviation applications. So it's some sort of steel. I don't know the exact uh, material, I don't know the exact temper, I don't know how it's treated. But it's some sort of steel, and it only goes on the governor. It goes on the push-pull rod that moves the governor you know, forward and, forward and back in terms of how much oil pressure is getting into the hub of the propeller. So it's not under 10,000 pounds of load. So there would be a really easy way, perhaps an ASTM standard or some other testing standard that we can apply to a sample part in all the different directions that this thing would be pushed, pulled, squeezed, twisted to see that over time, let's say some fatigue life, and that's a thousand hours, 20,000 hours, whatever it is, that this thing would be okay for the application. We could also send one, sacrifice one, if it's the only one that's left. We could sacrifice one and get it tested to see what the material is. Um, and that company would send us back and say, it's exactly this makeup of steel. It's exactly this composition of steel or it's exactly this composition of aluminum. And we can have companies like Send Cut Send match that type of material or 
go to a, another source, a local machine shop that is handling uh, CAD files and CAD programming and say, hey, make me 15 of these and see what it would cost, okay? So I'm not trying to put local CNC shops out of business. I'm just saying that if we have problems in affordability, if the difference between your airplane flying safely or flying or flying not so safe is going out and using modern tools, we should be looking at those modern tools. Thank you so much, Ryan, for sending this part to me. I, I, it really got my, my blood flowing. It got my mind wrapped around the idea that there are solutions out there for our small, old, very old airplanes. And it exists right within the palm of some of our hands. People like me and some of you out there who are engineers and designers can really do a nice job of taking little, little brackets here and there getting CAD models, making some parts, and then making the parts available, either for a small fee if you're set up that way and the FAA approves you to do that, or for free so that owners like me and you can go out and maintain our products. So the disclaimers are always gonna stand. I'm an engineer, I'm an aerospace engineer, I'm a flight test engineer, I work really closely with an IA. I also work really closely with FAA representatives on a regular basis where I can ask some of these questions. I know that owners can produce their own parts. I also know that there is a limit to where we can and should not go. I will not put these on the airplane, but this is a thought experiment, a thought process behind getting things made so we can keep these airplanes flying, okay? Go ahead and leave your thoughts in the comments. I know someone's gonna say, well, you PMA and TSO is wah, I can't make all these parts and stuff, but there's sometimes no other solution. And if you're going to look me in the face, look me in the eye, and tell me that a part that was probably designed in the 50s and manufactured in the 50s cannot be improved upon in 2025 moving into 2026, if you stare me down and tell me that, I'll call you a liar. We can do better. We can keep these airplanes flying. We can find clever, safe, engineered solutions to help us fly. If you're flying around at 120, 150 knots and 8,000 feet, there's really no excuse for us to not be able to put modern engineering and modern manufacturing processes to work for the old airplanes that we have. We can make them better. We can make them faster. We can make them more safe if we just use the modern tools that are available. Okay, in the comments, let me know what you think. I think I, uh, when I edit this, I'm gonna put little screen grabs here and there so I can prove to you what the actual numbers are. I'm not kidding when I say like seven, 10, $20 for these parts. That's really what it worked out to be. Let me know what you think. And I really, really hope that we think about these airplanes in a totally different light moving forward because I'm tired of seeing them scrapped I'm tired of seeing them hanging on by a thread when we have done so much better in the automotive world, in the recreational boating world, in the commercial aviation space, in the space space. We can do better. Let's do better. Reach out. Let me know what you think. Give me some ideas. Give me some examples. And maybe we'll take one of these things to a full up manufacturing process. Why not? It's only 20 bucks, right? Catch you later.